everybody. This is Mark Chapardini with Go See Talk. We have an extra special guest on the show today, Mr. Extraordinary Composer, um, Audiotician. You can make up all the words for uh, <laughs> the amazing things John Debney has done to our ears. And you may know him from The Jungle Book, Bruce Almighty, The Replacements. But John's work in the cinematic landscape knows no boundaries. He's been to Salem, Massachusetts, home of the Sanderson sisters. He's been to Jellystone Park, Golgotha, Oaky Oaks, Sin City, the Island of Lost Dreams, the seven levels of the Candy Cane Forest. He's even been to <laughs> Cutthroat Island. And now we can add Neverland, Wonderland, and Cobbleton to his impressive passport exploits. So, John, welcome to the show. How have you been doing this year? And please, what, what, what's been going on in your world? Oh, thanks, Mark. Well, what an in introduction. Um, I love the way you put it, you know, because that's really what we do as, uh, especially as a composer, you have to travel to these different far places in the world and, and try to, you know, accompany films that take places in all kinds of, of locales. So thank you for the great introduction. I'm doing great. Uh, you know, even amidst COVID work, work has changed a bit, but nonetheless, I'm very busy, which I'm very grateful for. And, uh, it's just great to talk to you again. Excellent, excellent. Uh, yeah, I believe the last time we spoke, and probably the first time, was when we uh, went over Bonnie and Clyde. I don't know if that rings a bell with you. That was kind of a passion it project does. for you. Yeah, that was a passion project for me. I, I don't know why. I, I just loved that working on that show and that that period in, in you know our our country's history is just fascinating me. And those two characters are amazingly fascinating to me and I don't know why but yeah that was the last time I think we spoke and um, that was a really fun project for me I you know loved it so mm -hmm. I wish we we should speak more often you know <laughs> well great I'll have my people who call your people or great converse of that um, well you've had a, a big year this year you have two movies back to back you have come away and jingle jangle um, yep. you know honestly I that is a perfect double bill, if you ask me, both for um, fantastical stories and your music. And I don't know Thank which you. one I like better, probably the one I'm listening to at the moment. So uh, what, what do you start with? Well, <clears throat> boy, that's sweet of you to say. Um, yeah, I've been very blessed this year to, in this crazy year, to have been brought on to two projects that I think are just so magical and magnificent. Uh, the first one being Come Away, which is starring Angelina Jolie and, and has a great cast. David Oye, Oye, I can never say his name. Oyello? Oyello, thank you. Um, and it's just a wonderful movie, magical movie, great director, Brenda Chapman, great cast. Uh, the cast is, uh, is so interesting and, and different, and yet, it, and yet both of these movies that we're gonna talk about seem to be related in, in a weird way. So there's Come Away, a very beautiful emotional fam fantasy adventure. And then there's the amazing Jingle Jangle, which is a musical and this huge, you know, canvas uh, for me as a composer. Uh, and so both projects have been really a, a gift, you know, for me to, to work on. And they both sort of spoke to my heart. Um, Come Away is sort of very intimate, and I wanted to create something really, you know, emotionally beautiful and gut-wrenching at the same time, based on what's going on in the film, and fanciful. I wanted something to be, who wouldn't want to write music for Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland, and combine those two, and that's what this film is. Same with Jingle Jangle. Um, you know, great song, amazing songs, uh, great cast, Forrest Whitaker. Uh, and they're, they're related in that they're, you know, period pieces with, with an amazing ensemble cast for both of them. So again, I, you know, I don't know why me, but I, I've been blessed by these two and I'm really grateful. Well, you know, I guess, what you spoke to when you're talking about um, Come Away is kind of a what if story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what if Peter Pan and Alice were, were brother and sister, which yeah. is an interesting backdrop. And then you have the Captain Hook element and, you know, the yeah. unfortunate uh, misery that befalls the family. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of a tough movie to watch just in terms of, 
you don't know it. I would describe it as maybe bittersweet because well, it is. Yeah. yeah. I, I love that you're describing it that way. I agree with you. I think for me, it, the movie is a little, it, it might, I hope it finds its audience because I think it's a really beautiful movie, but it, it is, it, you're not sure in some parts of the movie, if, is this going to be like about these kids and it's going to be this magical fanciful thing. And yet there's a very tragic aspect to this. I, I would crystallize it. I always describe that movie as, you know, a family that goes through a, a tragic event. Um, and because of the tragic event, this brother and sister duo, Peter and Alice, have to kind of make up their own world to deal with, you know, this horrific event. Um, I don't know if we're allowed to spoil things, but through the through the loss of, of their brother dying. So it it's a little bit of a, you're walking a tightrope there. Um, but for me, ultimately, to me, it's, it's an uplifting story. It's a beautiful story. It's, um, again, fanciful. Um, and I hope that's the way people uh, that watch it, you know, feel that way, that it's sort of beautiful, magical. In the very end of the movie, you sort of get the, the message, you know, that we're all, uh, we're all as, you know, we're, we're all young if we can believe. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that's sort of the message. Um, same with Jingle Jangle, I must say. I think they're similar. And I know we'll talk about that. I'd love to get your, your feed, you know, your, your feeling about that movie. But yeah, I think they're both kind of in that fanciful world. And, and I'm, which I love. I love writing. I'll, I'll give you an example. I did a film called Dragonfly many years ago. Oh, the Kevin Costner movie. Kevin Costner movie. And, you know, to me, I feel it's a, sort of an underappreciated gem. It, it's um, that movie dealt with very, very weighty topics of, you know, loss of and and life after death or or spirituality. You know, something. Um, you know, and and I think in a similar way, Come Away is sort of touching on those kinds of issues. Jingle Jangle is just this. To me, it's a beautiful story about this character uh Geronicus Jangle who is a master toy maker uh he creates these amazing toys and yet he's he's you know estranged from his daughter and his granddaughter and to me the story is about him refinding his his magic and reconnecting with his daughter and his granddaughter and i think that's really for me what jingle jangle is about if that that's the storyline that I kind of grabbed when I was hired and read the script. Gotcha. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I, I mentioned a double bill earlier and I think the way that made me appreciate it is I watched come away first mm. and then I went into jingle jangle. And I think it's this constant, you know, barring the ups and downs and the real, you know, emotional loss, it really just sort of shoots you to the moon. So I think that the whole process, and especially from somebody, maybe you've heard this before, not a big musical fan, um, I, I was definitely into Jingle Jangle, and uh, I, cool. I appreciated everything about that movie. Cool. Um, Great to hear. Great to hear. Well, let, let's dive into it then. Um, you know, C Come Away, there, there's some cer certain elements in Come Away that uh, I think maybe only manifested because they, they were elements of the story. So something sure. like the, the Irish band. <laughs> um, yeah. Would yeah. an Irish band have made sense if that wasn't the place where um, uh, David Oyello played, you know, the, the gambling halls that David Oyello frequented? Well, I love that you're diving deep and I love it. A um, couple of ideas why the Irish band. One of the things that Brenda Chapman and I talked about, our director is wonderful, Brenda Chapman, you know, wrote Lion King, directed Brave, um, amazing talent, wonderful person. Um, one of the things we talked about was what type of score should this be? And I, I think I kind of always envisioned it to be magical, heartfelt, you know, mysterious when it needs to be, but ultimately really uplifting. One of the other things that we talked about stylistically with the score was Brenda's a big fan of world music, as am I. And we talked about the Lost Boys, and 
talked about the idea of kind of Celtic percussion and Celtic instruments, Irish music. And we both kind of latched on to the Irish of thinking maybe the Lost Boys could have kind of a primitive Celtic drummy sound. And that then morphed into uh, the, the idea of Irish music that, uh, that you mentioned takes place in the bar. We, we kind of have, you know, what, who hasn't been in a pub with uh, Irish musicians in it? So that kind of all morphed together so that the Lost Boys kind of started our thought process. And then of course, when we go into the little town, um, into the pub, why not have the the same Irish band, as it were, that that is performing for the Lost Boys, kind of their sound? Why don't we also put that into the bar? And that's what we did. So it kind of made sense to us, I know, cr crazily, but it kind of made sense to give us a little, another palette of colors to paint with. Does that make sense? So oh, no, sure does, sure does. That's that's sort of why we did that. It was more more about the Lost Boys, and then that informed, of course, the the, the richness of the culture and what would we hear in this pub at that time in the 1890s or whenever this takes place. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you mentioned world music and, and I'm not sure this is world music or this is, uh, or how you achieve this sound, but there's a track called um, Mirror, uh, Mirror Orphanage Story that has kind of yeah. a crist crystalline uh, instrument mm. at the beginning of it. Can you talk about that and these little touches? I'd love to. And boy, you, you, as always, you've got the greatest ears. Um, I can get nothing by you. What that instrument is, you know, one of my early, you know, when, when you're just starting to, to process things, at least I do this as a composer, I, I, can, I keep thinking always of sounds and instruments and what might work for a certain film. And in this one, there's an instrument called the glass harmonica. And what that is, it's, it's an instrument, it's kind of a big instrument that has a series of glass cylinders, circular things. And you, it sounds weird, but you turn this thing, it's all hand cranked. And then you, you can wet your hands a little bit, just like on a wine glass, you know, how you can make a sound out of a wine. It's, that's what this is. Okay. Except on a broad scale. And so you turn it and then you can, put your finger on on different cylinders to make it tones. So my friend, Nate Barr, Nathan Barr is a wonderful composer, a friend of mine, has these incredible instruments at his studio that like the glass harmonica, that are very interesting world music, oddball instruments. Um, and <clears throat> I contacted him and I said, Nate, can I come over and sample your instrument and maybe play it for this movie uh and he said sure you know i never got over to his place because <laughs> covid made it impossible to go over and be in the same room and do all that so what we did was we created our own sort of uh glass harmonica i took a sample of a glass harmonica and kind of tweaked it a bit so throughout the score your ears picked it up great um there is this glass harmonica that's kind of a ethereal sometimes it's just a pad it's just a sound and other times it's it's kind of mimicking or playing a melody mm -hmm. and that's what that instrument is and that we use that one throughout come away um the other thing i did was i found a great sample of a of a, a boy soprano and i used that in come away also and i tried it and it was one of those things where you try everything as you're beginning to create a score and i tried the boy soprano I, I tried the glass harmonica and our director loved it especially the boy soprano sound because that i always envisioned the boy soprano sound as kind of the spirit of the brother that dies and um, okay. so i bring it back at different times and it's quite i think it's quite haunting i i don't know at least for me it is and um hopefully people will enjoy it but that that's sort of the method to that madness of orchestration and and, and the why of it all mm -hmm. well you know if if uh if imdb is to believed um i think it's a it's a source of some sort um 
It yeah. says that you on rare occasions perform an instrument, whether sometimes it's your score, oh, sometimes yeah. another score. Uh, sure. what, what if anything was done on Come Away? And what were you kind of happy to lend your hands? Boy, that's a good question. I, I, I have to think back a little bit. On Come Away, I, I don't think I performed anything other than I do perform the score. So I play everything into my computer and then that, that gets translated eventually to live instruments. But on Come Away, I don't think I played much. Sometimes I'll play a little flute or I'll play a little, I'm looking over here at my electric cello. Um, sometimes I'll play a little melodica, which is like, it's behind me. It's a little, <laughs> you've seen them. They're like a little keyboard thing that you blow through. Okay. Um, but I play a lot of guitar on my scores, that's for sure. But I I play everything on all my scores to demo them. And we usually use a lot of what I do. So I become kind of that, I, I play a lot of the own, uh, my own instruments on my own scores. Mm -hmm. um, jingle Jangle, let me think what I did on Jingle Jangle. I, I did play a, a, a bit of uh, flute on that, like, like a, just a primitive recorder on Jingle Jangle. Okay. We, we ended up not using it. It was kind of, I'm not the best player in the world, but anyway. So yeah, I do perform. I love it. And especially when it's a guitar or electric cello that I play a bit. So it's fun. It makes it fun. Yeah. And, and sometimes I imagine you would need um, more material than less material. So you can sort of yes. just weed through or dial in. Oh, my, my, uh, my, <laughs> my drawers full of old material are overflowing, you know, so <laughs> you never know, you know, you, you write a score and you do things many times, certain pieces many times over, and hopefully you get the one that, you know, the director loves. And then you, you, you know, that becomes part of the score, but there are so many things that we discard that we don't use that um, someday, I guess I'll do an album of all the rejected pieces <laughs> I've written, you know, that might yeah. be fun, actually. You know, I, I talked to, um, to James Newton Howard about that, and he, I, th I think he, if I remember right, he uses the phrase lost sheep. So those yeah. are kind of like things that he started, but just yeah. by the virtue of the creative process have gone. But um, well, sometimes, I would, yeah. Yeah, I would guess with my friend James Newton Howard that his lost sheep, his discarded ideas are brilliant. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I don't know about my lost sheep, but I know James's material is just Excellent. wonderful. So. Well, I'm, I'm going to kind of geek out for a second, but sure. um, one thing I noticed about Come Away is that you grabbed the very first frame of the, the movie when you're getting into the title cards of the producers and the it studio. Um, you know, what goes into the mindset of just really taking that cinematic canvas from point A to point end of credits? Is there... A That's a great question. Um, this one, in Come Away, we, you know, you talk at length with director about his or her wants and, and what they think something should be. I think that was one of those discussions where I mentioned to Brenda, Brenda, it might be nice to, you know, if you let, if you let me give it a shot, um, start right at frame, frame one and work my way through. And what it did for me on that movie and, and most of the movies where I've get, been given that chance, it enables me to establish kind of a, a palette of not only the sounds and the instrumentation, but it also enables me to establish themes. And that was a crucial piece for me in Come Away uh, because it, you've seen the movie and you know the way that whole first piece is, Mark, and you know this, it starts out with a beautiful sort of voiceover. We see this lush countryside and then we move through and we kind of learn the characters a little bit and there's more voiceover. And then we end up with this kind of rollick, rollicking or frolicking um, adventure thing with pirates. And so that first piece to me was a very important piece that I had to establish this haunting world of, of what magical world. And then also do the, you know, play the storyline and then work into you know the 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 arc of these characters and and all of a sudden we're in this kind of adventure pirate um feeling 
thing that moves us through to the end. So it, it's a nice, I think it's a nice piece. It's like three and a half minutes of establishing themes, establishing tones. And uh, it was, it was fun and, and uh, lovely. It gave me an opportunity to do what, you know, a composer would love, which is stretch out and to really state themes. And that's what it enabled me to do. It was really fun. Yeah, and I could I could see how like you mentioned the boy soprano, which is not a uh, not a a part of the score that I really picked up on, but I could see how now that that leads into it, especially the way I I, I think what the, was sent from your your agent was uh, three alt alternate versions of the end credits. So I think there's three, yeah. keys. and just they all are subtly different, but that sort of soprano is a is a nice touch on that to give it that kind of haunting feel almost. Yeah. To, well, thanks. Speak. Yeah, I hope so. It it's interesting. You you talk about the sub themes. I'll tell you the interesting thing about that movie, which brings up your point. Um, because we have the two characters, uh, Peter and Alice, um, who are brother and sister. I I wanted to develop themes for each. And what was interesting about the movie was Peter's theme starts at the very beginning, and it's all kind of Peter's movie till kind of the midway point, and then all of a sudden. And I did this subconsciously. I didn't even really plan on it. But Alice's theme then kind of starts to take over to the point where Alice's theme from the middle to the end of the movie is kind of the dominant theme. And I, and I guess that was just a subconscious call on my part that as we start shifting focus, it really does shift over to Alice's story somewhere in the midpoint. Um, where initially it's Peter and I was in Peter Pan's world, we kind of shift over to Alice's world and the, and the relationship with her mom. And the Alice arc is a very interesting kind of arc. Uh, though, though hopefully everybody will see this movie. Um, it's interesting that, you know, the story we all know and love, the way Brenda has, or the writer represented uh, the, you know, the, the good queen and the bad queen, the red queen and the white queen. Uh, very interesting. And midway through, hopefully this isn't so long and long-winded, but midway through, Alice really becomes the focus. And in my opinion, and then Alice kind of takes us through the rest of the movie until, you know, towards the end when there's a really beautiful ending scene where we realize who Alice is. I don't want to spoil that, mm -hmm. but, uh, and really who Peter is and Peter Pan. And uh, anyway, so there are really two themes. And I did that first cue that you mentioned two ways. I did it one way that was Peter centric and one way that was uh, Alice centric. And I think Brenda, you know, I, I, she used the Peter centric one because I, and I think that was right for the beginning of the film. Um, Peter's theme, interestingly enough, you know, sometimes you struggle with a theme. Peter's theme kind of just came out of me really quickly. I'm thankful for that um, when that happens. And uh, there's something about Peter's theme that, that I, I quite love. I don't know where that came from, but um, I love both themes. So, yeah, we did do different areas of the film in, in a, using the themes from Peter and Alice and, and interchange them sometimes. Well, great. Congratulations on cracking that code. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. I hope I did. If, if, you know, if people like it, I guess they cracked it. Well, you, you, so you got to also get, you got to crack it jingle jangle, which is, yes. uh, I have to say the more I think about that, the more I, I enjoy it. It's not that I didn't at first, but now it's just sort of, like I said, shooting constant trending upwards. Um, right. Before we get into that, it seems like that you have kind of a lock on holidays. I mean, you've got Hocus Pocus, you've got Elf, you've got Jingle yeah. Jangle, you even have Draft Day, which is a very important day in the calendar. I so do, you know, and you forgot too. And this is, somebody brought this up to me. Thanks for mentioning that. I love being the holiday composer, I must tell you. Um, there's Mother's Day and there's uh, Valentine's Day. Oh, and New Year's Eve. And all three of those, by the way, were done with my dear friend, and I miss him every day, Gary Marshall. Um, I think Gary did Valentine's Day, and they figured there was a, an audience for people <laughs> on these different holidays to see 
movies. Uh, and so we did Valentine's Day, then we did, I think, New Year's Eve, and I think Mother's Day was the last one we did together. And um, I don't know why, I'm, I'm lucky. I, Elf, you know, I, Elf and Hocus Pocus have become holiday favorites, and nobody's more grateful than me. I, Hocus Pocus bombed when it came out in the middle of summer, you know, way back, what, 93 or 94? Yeah. And I think that Disney brought that out, you know, the wisdom of, uh, of the time was they probably brought that out in July because they knew they had Nightmare Before Christmas near Christmas. And, you know, Nightmare Before Christmas is amazing. Sure. So maybe they didn't want them to conf conflict. But oddly, over the years, Hocus Pocus just keeps building. And every year it gets bigger um, to the point where, Thankfully, now they're going to do, I think, number two, and uh, hopefully they'll call me. I, you know, that's it. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, I don't know how I got dealt that hand, but I'm grateful, you know, because during those, during those holidays, I, I, I always get a kick out of seeing, oh, there's Hocus Pocus or, you know, so God, some people watch Hocus Pocus every night through the month of October. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I've had people say, yeah, we're on our 28th viewing, you know, so I'm, I'm thanking, thank you, everybody. Well, it's funny, I, I, I thought of you when I was driving through um, the neighborhood across the street from where I live. Uh, it's a young family, you could tell, but they had put up Halloween decorations mm -hmm. and, and they had actually spent time and energy to do six foot plywood cutouts of the Sanderson sisters. Oh, and, did, and I just thought... I thought you're right. Yeah, the movie didn't do well at first, but over time, I guess if you give it enough saturation in the public culture, anything could be a hit, you know? You, yes, true. And But I'll tell you, I thought it was that great from day one. And, you know, you never know in, in, in the film business, um, things that you think are going to be hits aren't, and things that you think aren't that great, maybe, become big hits. Um, but I always felt hocus pocus. I think I was the lone voice in the wilderness on that because I, for many years now, have gone to every year, go to showings at here in LA or there are showings in other places in our country and all over the world sometimes. Um, and I always try to go and support, if I can, the showings of Hocus Pocus because there's such a fan base out there. And now it's just, it's grown to be crazy. You know, it, it's just, but I, I felt that many years ago when I did it, that this was a great movie that I hoped and prayed would find an audience. And it, and it really has. I think being on the Disney Channel for a number of years really helped it grow. And, sure. uh, which we're thank so thankful about. Well, it, I guess in, in that respect, that brings up something that's been kind of weighing heavy on my mind. Uh, I haven't been feeling the greatest uh, in the last maybe 48 hours, and maybe you can help me out with this. I've sure. been reading up on these um, these internet personalities, these uh, these legends, I think they're called. Did, uh, maybe you've, you've heard of them. Bette Midler, Kenny Ortega, oh, John yeah. Favreau. Yep. Robert Downey Jr. How come yeah. there is no uh, John Debney attached to these <laughs> Disney legends? Oh man, aren't you sweet? Wow, Mark. Well, boy, that's very, very sweet of you. Um, let me give you a little history. You may know this, but maybe your listeners don't know this. But my father, Louis Louis Debney, worked at Disney Studios for forty years. Um, my dad, <clears throat> during the Depression, very quick story, during the Depression in the 30s, um, had to quit school to help support his family. So he became a paper boy. You know, the, in the old way back when, there'd be paper boys and girls that would, you know, have these big bags on and people would drive up and buy a newspaper. Well, my dad, back in those days, um, I think when he was about 16 years old, would camp out on a corner, sell newspapers to people that would drive by. Walt Disney would drive by every day and would buy a, a paper from my dad. <laughs> and every day after a while, after my dad got to know him, I guess the story goes, um, my dad would ask him for a job. And 
you know, again, the story goes that Walt would be, yeah, Kim, I'll, you know, I'll kind of think, I'll think about you and blah, blah. Well, one day after this was going on for a while, one day my dad asked him again for a job and Walt said, you know, we're going to be moving to a bigger facility over here on a Hyperion, on Hyperion Street right over here. And he said, why don't you come over and we'll, maybe we'll, we'll find something for you to do. So my dad went over there, got a job. His first job at D Disney Studios was as a clapper boy, you know, the clap on, yeah. on Snow White. And no way. Um, honest to God truth. I have, a, I have my dad's contract and there are like five names on it. There weren't that many studio employees yet. So I don't know how many people worked at the studio back in 1939, I think, ish I'm talking about maybe 30, 40 people. So my dad was there at the ground floor. My dad spent his whole career there, 40 plus years, um, retired in the eighties after a very long career and, you know, passed away many years ago, but he was a fixture at that studio. So if anybody's a legend, it was my dad. And um, there was talk, has been some talk a year or two ago about, you know, what if we did a, a twofer? What if, what if, you know, we did myself and my dad as one package? And, and if that happens, that would be great. I mean, that, that would be wonderful to uh, be a legend along with my dad. Now, I don't expect that. And I, I don't, I don't lobby for it, but <clears throat> boy, I've sure done a lot for the studio. Yeah. So I don't know. You're too humble, John. You're too humble. You need to two, <laughs> two both horns. <laughs> Well, you're very kind, Mark. I, I've done a lot for Disney. Love Disney. Um, been so good to me. So if that happens one day, cool. You know, I'd love it, but no, don't expect it. But thank you. Well, uh, but but I mean, you know, you said your dad worked for forty years. You yourself have been uh, steadily working for yes. forty year, four decades. Congratulations! Wow, has it been that long? I guess it has. Yeah, yeah it has. You've been doing this more as a profession than I've been breathing oxygen. Not by much, <laughs> but still, it's commendable. Thank you. I am the most blessed person you'd ever want to meet. Because um, you're right. That is, I sometimes have to, you know, when you mention IMDB, IMDB, for those that don't know, um, I'm sure people know, but it's a, it's a internet database of all your credits in, in the movie business or TV business, in, in show business, whatever. And I'm even struck by the fact when I looked at, look at my page, uh, I can't believe the number. I don't remember half of it. I just, which is a good thing. It's a good thing because I don't know, God or the powers that be gave me this opportunity to maybe, you know, compartmentalize things. And once I'm done with something, I kind of forget about it. And, you know, I, I'm always trying to get better with every job I do. So. I don't know, maybe that helps me try to stay a little bit focused and try to stay as fresh as I can. I don't know if that makes sense, but I know there's a great quote by John Williams, you know, I'm, I'm not quote, gonna quote it properly, but John's been quoted a few times as saying, oh, you know, Maestro, you've done so many, you've done Star Wars and E.T. and all these incredible iconic films. And John's answer always has struck me as the most humble, gracious answer, because that's who he is. He's humble and gracious. Um, he says, ah, oh, you know, I'm still trying to make it better every time, you know. <laughs> and that's what I try to do. And I, I don't know, that's always sunk in for me that I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, I've done a ton of stuff. I'm still, you know, I'm still breathing. Uh, I'm still in shape. Thank you. And uh, I hope to do this till I'm 90. So maybe I'll have like a 70 year. <laughs> give me a plaque or something at the end of that. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I, I hope it goes that far and, and beyond. I, and, you. and you just, you made me think of something. Um, <clears throat> you know, you mentioned your dad and the, yeah. the, the lineage you have with Disney. Do you have any stories from, you know, running around the studio as a you wow. know, studio brat and anything that you can share? Are you kidding? I have so many stories that I would bore you to tears, but you know, yes, uh, I was one of those kids. I was so lucky to have great parents. I'm an only child. 
So I didn't have a bunch of brothers and sisters like you know, hugging me and stuff. So <laughs> I was, I guess I could say it now. I was spoiled, uh, you know, whatever, spoiled kid. But I don't think I was ever bratty or anything. I was just, I was just fortunate. And my parents would, uh, yeah, we'd spend time, oh boy. I was always at the studio. I was always on the back lot of Walt Disney Studio where they used to have a Western town, you know. Now it's all buildings and animation and everything. There used to be a Western town back there and we'd go play cops. We were all cowboys and Indians in, in the day. And I knew all the Disneys, Roy Jr. and the Disney family. They're all great friends. Um, the Walkers, the, I, I can mention all these names, but anyway i grew up in that family and i would i was on the set i remember i'll t give you a couple stories i was on the set of mary poppins as a kid uh in particular i remember the bank scene where dick van dyke dresses up as an old man <laughs> and uh i remember being on i was on the set of toy babes in toyland i was on the set of too many to even mention uh i i got to um this is funny. I'll share something that I don't share that often. Because I was the son of a producer, my dad ended up being a producer at Disney after many years. My dad would get me in as an extra. So I was a little kid scared to death because I was a shy kid. I was an extra on like these, there's a film called Monkeys Go Home. Do you remember that one? Uh, no, Nobody but... remembers that one. <laughs> no, but don't, don't feel bad. Uh, anyway, and, and others, Love Bug, I think I was an extra. Um, these are all movies that guy, people your age probably have never seen, to be honest. But anyway, I was an extra on a number of things. Um, I got to go down to Disneyland all the time. I remember walking through some of the rides. I remember walking through Haunted Manor, Haunted Mansion, when uh, they were building it. Um, oh. All of these, many of those rides, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean. I got to walk through, you know, go down this big staircase and go down there and everybody was building those animatronic figures. And it was, it was, it was amazing. If I write a book someday, I've got to relate all those, but I was there for all of that. Um, best story probably I have is, you know, I would, my dad would take me to the studio cause we were best buddies. Cause you can imagine I'm an only child and my dad and I did everything together and he was a great man. Um, and he used to take me to the studio on a Saturday or Sunday during the day and nobody would be at Walt Disney Studios during, on a weekend. And invariably he would take me around, we'd walk the hallways, he'd show me things and we'd walk into animators rooms and see, you know, storyboards of something, you know, whatever they were working on. And a number of times this happened where we'd be walking and we'd bump into this man. Uh, now, mind you, I was back then probably six, seven years old, something like that. And we would bump into this man and I, I didn't know it for a long time who this man was. Well, this man turned out to be Walt Disney and, you know, Walt would come to the studio on a weekend for a very funny reason. Walt, you know, loved uh, the studio, loved his people so much, loved, loved everything about what he'd created that he really wanted to see what everybody was doing. So Walt would <laughs> go to the studio on a weekend and walk the halls and go into all the animators rooms and see what they were doing and kind of peek under the hood. True story. And the reason he did it on the weekend is, and I think you'll love this, during the week, normal work hours, Walt had a very specific way of walking and talking, and he had kind of a smoker's cough. And back in the day, people that, you know, smoked a lot, they know what that is. And they, the animators would always know when Walt was lurking. So they'd, you know, so they'd always say, oh, Walt's coming down the hall. Or somebody would tell somebody, Walt's coming down the hall. So they don't, you know, oh, God, got to get busy. Yeah. Oh, hey, Walt, yeah, you know, true story. So That's Walt awesome. would come there on weekends and kind of peek under the hood. And I many times would be there with my dad. And sometimes I'd be on my dad's shoulders or I'd be walking with my dad. And I remember this guy tussling my hair. I used to have a lot of hair. Back. 
And it used to be red, by the way. People don't know that. Even I'm so gray now. But um, yeah, I used to tussle my hair. And I swear to God, when I tell the story, I'm six years old again. Because the feeling I got from this man was utter warmth and joy. Like, uh, you know, hey, you know, whatever he called me. You know, hey, Lou, you know. Uh, and I remember, you know, finally, probably, I don't know, a number, couple of years after we'd bump into him all the time, I'd say, well, yeah, dad, who is that? You know, as a little kid, he goes, oh, that's Walt. You know, that's Walt Disney. So, you know, and, and here's the end of that story. Probably, you know, Dick Sherman and I, Richard Sherman, the amazing Richard Sherman, the Sherman mm -hmm. brothers. Richard is a very good friend of ours. And Richard we've been friends since I was a kid. So we have commiserated a couple times over the years that we're getting to the point where Richard Sherman, myself, maybe two or three other people are the only ones left that have actually met Walt Disney or wow. been around the real guy. Somebody brought that up to me and I thought, I thought about it like, you know, yeah. So I just, again, i blessed can you imagine that that i have that memory and i get to muse on all that and there are a million of other stories but that's probably the one that's nearest to my heart is that story that, that that's exceptional i, I was going to say yeah, yeah you, you better better start writing that book or yeah i could have you on the podcast every week and we can go we can go little by little and chronicle everything whatever you want oh my god how fun would that be um yeah i I'd like to put it down. I really would. I, I, what I'd like to do eventually is go to the Disney archives, really work with them. Uh, I, I want to develop a really good hand. I want to get a handle on everything my dad did at the studio, kind of chronicle that. And I've got a lot of his material and his contracts and things from when he started there. And I'd love to chronicle that. And then I'd love to then, move into my career at the studio because I got to be honest with you, Mark, uh, I've done so much for the studio that I've forgotten half of it from television specials. When I was a younger kid, a guy to theme park, a lot of theme park music as, as you may know, and then a lot of films. And I continue to do, thankfully, I continue to do a lot for Disney. And so I'd love to get that, that lineage thing from when my dad started all the way through what I've done. And then just to have it, just to know it. And then maybe it'll end up in some kind of book. I don't know. I don't know. I just, you know, the records weren't that great when you go back to 1939, 1940. Um, so I want to chronicle that at some point. Sure. You know, I've, I've heard that they keep some, um, some documents, frames of old movies in a salt archive. Is that, is that accurate or is, do you I know think, that? I think that is accurate. Um, wow, that brings up another story. Um, I've heard that. I, I don't know that for a fact, but I've heard that over the years many times that there are some, there's some storage somewhere that they, where they keep maybe the original prints of some of those films and the, you know, cause they're very fragile. Um, a lot of those nitrate, I guess it, whatever they made, those films, celluloid, whatever they made those films out of are very flammable and they really disintegrate. So I think that's true. One, the one anecdote I have from that's sort of related to that is when I was started working at the studio professionally out of when I got my out of college, I got my degree uh, in, you know, for in composition. Uh, and I remember luckily when I got out of college again, through, my very fortunate, uh, uh, you know, circumstances where I'm the son of someone that worked there. Um, I got a job in the music department. Um, so now this is maybe when I'm 20 something, 21, 20 maybe. And I actually worked on staff at Disney Studios back in the in that time period. And one of my first jobs was, and this is fun. Um, <clears throat> you know, they were looking for things for me to do because I was a young fresh guy there and, <laughs> hey what are you doing John take this over to so-and-so's house you know so I, I would go deliver scripts to Henry Mancini's house or John Barry's house and I would sometimes get to meet them no way hi Mr. 
Barry, you know, and, <laughs> you know, and, and so I, that's what I did. So one of my jobs then was, you know, one day the head of, head of my department said, Hey, John, you know, I think they were looking for things for me to do, which was very sweet and, you know, keep me busy. It gave me a task to go down. There is a storage area below that one of the oldest buildings on Disney Studios lot. It's the Shorts building. And it's called the Shorts building because that was where in the 30s they would do the little shorts. They would do Steamboat Willie or whatever the shorts, those hundreds of shorts that they did. So under the Shorts building, and it's still there to this day, there is a dungeon that I call it. There are tunnels through Disney Studio that a lot of people probably don't even know about. Maybe I'm the only one that knows about them. I don't know. But anyway, so they, I, one of my jobs was I would go down to the dungeon, and I wasn't sure. They wanted me to organize the scores. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, they're going to go down there, and there's probably just things, and they want me to make it more organized. I, I mean, I'll never forget the day I went down there. I turned on the light. There's this not very big room, not maybe not even as big as the room I'm in now. And lights go on, there's pipes and there's water dripping from the pipes and there's these stacks and stacks and stacks of music, you know, scores and parts and all kinds of stuff. Some were in plastic, some were just, you know, there was a rubber band around them or a, a tie around them. And I start, I had to go, God, this is a weird place. So I started looking through and I would realize in a very short period of time, I'm looking at the original handwritten scores of Dumbo, or I'm look, looking at the original scores of everything, of Sleeping yes. Beauty, of Snow White, of you name it. They were all there and they were all collecting dust and disintegrating. Some were in better shape than others. Some had water damage. Some, you know. So, can you imagine, Mark, as a young guy, going into, let's say, if you're a writer, let's say you, you know, if you're a writer and somebody tells you to go do something, and you go down and you discover that you're looking at all the original works of Edgar Allan Poe or somebody, you know, and you're, you know. Yeah. So what I did, I did, I organized that. That was a number of months. Um, organize it i got to take these scores home that they they said that was fine um this is before when you can make copies of stuff and i would you know if if i could have done it i probably would have done it but i would take them home i would study them i would study them i'd listen so in a weird way um fate stepped in and kind of gave me the opportunity to i don't know study at the foot of the masters as it were you know like Frank Churchill, Lee Harleen, you know, here's the original score to When You Wish Upon a Star. I mean, now, that was, whatever, 30 some odd years ago, 35. Since then, everything's been microfilmed and very organized, but back then it wasn't. Yeah. You know, so the original scores to all those were just literally collecting dust and, and decaying, and I organized them to a pretty good point where you know, made, made placards and I kind of, you know, mentioned the music department. We really have to do something about the water that's dripping on everything. <laughs> and they did, which was nice. So that was one of my first jobs at Disney. So I, I get to go down there and study these scores that nobody's seen in 30, 40 years or 50 years, people, things that people have forgotten about. Uh, that, so, that's oh, God, it was an amazing tutelage for i don't know what you'd call it for me just being able to soak all that in and see look under the hood i mean they had everything from original sketch scores which are not the full scores for the orchestra but are literally one or two lines of handwritten pencil and then above it the animators back then would lay out a scene let's say and they'd give the composer a stack of these sheets in they would go through and go, this action happens here. Um, this, you know, and then the composer would write underneath that descriptive thing. He would write music or she, well, in back then it was mostly the man of Disney wrote those scores, most of them. Um, so they would write their, their notes underneath it. And so you literally go back to the very 
beginning of of the genesis of what those scores were mm -hmm. and that's like that was astounding for me when i think back on it gosh yeah learn, just learning by osmosis and like you said yeah. being there with the masters amazing stuff. yeah and, and feeling it and smelling it the, you know it it's interesting the age of it yeah. it was really fun really amazing i can't even believe i was able to do that the thing <laughs> Gave you that job, but anyway. Well, you know, um, passing down stories from from your your dad to you. Now there's a uh, a John Debney Jr. who's popping up in a couple of your your works. Is yes? Is, is uh, he a, is he a Gustafson or is he an Edison when it comes to Apprentice? Oh, he he's an Edison. I have I have three boys. They're all great. They're all adults. Um, my my namesake John Jr. is my youngest. And he went to SC Film School, and he's very, very, very good. He wants to be a producer. He's a writer. He's working on his own stuff, and, and he's just amazing. My oldest son, Josh, is also helping me here at the studio. And he's writing music. He's, he's more song-driven. He's more contemporary-driven. Um, and he's doing great. So, yeah, um, my, other, my third son, my middle son, has nothing to do with music and I'm kind of glad about that because <laughs> he's doing his own thing. He's successful doing what he's doing. So excellent. Anyway, I'm, I'm blessed. And yeah, there's, there's a junior, maybe junior will end up doing that book. I don't know. <laughs> you know? That would be great, great, yeah. great legacy for, for the whole family. Um, cool. So with Jingle Jangle, you know, um, I think yeah. I remember uh, what Dennis Talbert was saying in uh, the video that we were shared is that he tried to show his son Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and it didn't really yes. resonate with his son. So he wanted to do something that was inclusive and as uplifting as Chitty was to David. So um, yeah. what, what yep. kind of discussions Correct. did you have with David to move the ball forward? Wow. Well, David has become, we are so close. We, we just talk almost every other day. We, we became brothers uh, through a lot of hard work. Um, and then COVID in the middle of all this. Um, yeah, the story goes with David is Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, I think is his favorite movie. And when we first met, I mentioned that's one of my favorite movies. Um, and then I mentioned, I said, well, you know, Richard Sherman, the Sherman brothers wrote Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and Mary Poppins and all these others. And he goes, oh my God, you know, Richard Sherman? I go, yeah, in fact, I do want, to try to, you know, when COVID is hopefully okay soon or someday, I want to try to get Richard Sherman, God bless him, with David, and we all have a little chat because <laughs> David is such a, a huge admirer of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and of the Sherman Brothers. So when David and I first got together, we shared that love, and he told me that story that he wanted to create a a, a classic that was um, inclusive and inviting to everyone, um, every, everybody in, of whatever background, whatever, you know, whoever you are. And I think he's successfully done that. But I think that's one of the things I love most about Jingle Jangle is that after about five minutes, three minutes of watching Jingle Jangle, you forget, you know, we're in Victorian era London. And you've got people of all ethnic backgrounds. And then you forget. It's like, oh, yeah, they're just wonderful characters. And it's, they all live in this beautiful you know, family and town and this world. And I think that's one of the greatest things I think that David accomplished with the movie. He makes it for everyone. Um, and maybe he, you know, he's also made, made it, I think, for people that have never had the opportunity to be or see a movie that highlights people of all backgrounds and all ethnic backgrounds. And he told me a story. I hope I, I don't embarrass him, but he told me a story. We were working on a big sequence, Mark. I don't know if you remember where our kids all of a sudden discover this, this magical robot. Oh yeah. Buddy. Three yes. Buddy. And um, they end up flying, you know, the kids end up flying. I hope I'm not spoiling anything. But that was a big moment and it needed big music and a big theme. And I remember David told me at one point, he goes, he goes, you know, this is really an important scene. I go, oh, I know, David, it's a really important scene in the kid. He goes, oh, it's a really important scene for other reasons. He goes, 
And he goes, you've never seen an African-American fly in a movie. And, and I, you know, I hope I'm not, you know, embarrassing, but it's so true. And I, and I realized, oh my God, there's a whole beautiful cultural thing that we're going through now. Thank God, change, you know, justice, um, culturally, we're, you know, we're all one, we're all, we're all the same. And I think Black Panther started this amazing thing, you know, just inclusiveness uh, with all of us as human beings. So I think David has hit upon in the best possible way, a movie that talks about all that. And I think it's wonderful. So anyway, um, on, on a lot of levels, I think the movie is just so important and so beautiful with what he's created. Well, I agree, and I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that, that scene because of the entire score, uh, the, there's the track Flying with Buddy that, if, if you will permit me, I was going to play about a minute and a half of it. Is there, sure. if you can hear it, can you kind of break down what's happening that helps make sure. it so big? Because I think it does, the flourishes in there are fantastic, and I'm, I, I just wanted to ask you about it. So let me sure. cue sure. this up. that piece of music so well big and glorious um that thank you for bringing that up that's one of my favorite pieces in the movie that i wrote we knew going in that, we, that there had to be a flying thing. we called it the flying or adventure theme there had to be some kind of overall arching theme and quite honestly you know i john williams is one of my favorite composers and i always i always dream about doing a scene like this one in Jingle Jangle where you're unabashedly huge and glorious and just wanted it to soar because our characters are soaring. And so that's maybe the area of that piece of music that, that you're, you're referring to. Um, and I must tell you that, uh, where we ended up, David loved it and we ended up in this great place where you hear this flying theme or adventure theme a couple a few times through the film uh one of them being there one of them being towards the end of the movie when we're in that big action scene the kids are in the tunnel big tunnel and and so i i'll just admit to you it's unabashedly my homage to john williams that's what it is because i love him so much and i i once told john um we were at the Hollywood, you know, he used to do the Hollywood Bowl concerts here in LA. And I was lucky enough to be able to go backstage and a number of times. And I would tell him every time I go backstage about, you know, this one year he was doing ET, the whole ending of ET that we all know and love makes me cry every time. And I remember telling him how just heartfelt and how, how that affected me so much. And again, being the gracious, humble man, he is, he kind of poo pooed it, but, to me, uh, that's what I was striving for was some kind of something on the scale just to do, you know, give him uh, my, it's, I'm just admitting it publicly. I'm trying to get a little of that fairy dust that John do, gives those great films that he's done. Every film he does are, but E.T. is a really special one for me. And so that's my little nod, I hope, to John. And, um, Anyway, well, you, you you hit it out of the park as you as oh, you tend to do. Thanks, so, man. Um, That's very I, kind of you. Thank you. Well, I'm I, I'm I'm so glad to spend some time with you, John. I hope that people can enjoy these films and these scores, and I really look forward to speaking with you again soon. And um, 
have Thanks. a merry rest of the year. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I, again, I look forward to seeing you again. Let's not, let's not wait every two or three years. Let's, we'll, we'll just figure out something to talk about, but I do thank you. And I hope that everybody that hears or sees this, please, please enjoy the movies. And uh, I think you'll be uplifted and it, I hope you enjoy them. <laughs>